first. <laughs> hey guys, this is Jennifer from the Shooter's Mindset and we are live with episode 377. We have our co-host here, Greg Cannon. How's it going? Hey everyone. And our guest of the hour this week is Chris Simmons. How's, how's it going, Chris? It's going pretty good. How are you guys? Can't complain. If we did, nobody would care. So <laughs> might as well just not complain yeah. and be happy, right? <laughs> no, I yeah, think we're doing happy. pretty good. Pretty good. So for those that are unfamiliar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into shooting? Uh, so my name is Chris Simmons, uh, and I'm from Marion, North Carolina, uh, which is, you know, the western part of the state. Um, started shooting in 2004. Um, my, I guess it'd be a sophomore year in high school. Uh, for the ROTC uh, three-position air rifle team. Uh, first year I went out for it, I didn't make the team. Uh, really motivated me to come out and try to make it. Next year come out and made the team. Uh, won three national championships uh, the following three years. Um, then I got into three-position small bore. Uh, a little bit of NRA, high power across the course shooting, uh, small bore silhouette, high power silhouette, uh, and now PRS and NRL. Done a little bit of everything. Yeah, yeah, the, you know, throughout the years, you know, I set goals and met those goals and moved on, and so that's kind of where I'm at now. That's fun to kind of move through all the genres. You've done pretty much everything with a rifle that's out there. I guess not F. -H. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, no real uh, pistol shoot. I shot a little bit of three gun. I shot a couple matches and it really wasn't just for me. Uh, so I moved on from it. Um, so yeah, it's been good. I've seen a lot of sports growing, uh, you know, in particular rimfire is growing tremendously it's you know it's getting to be huge so it's, it's great to see yeah rimfire i know we're going to talk a little bit more about it uh throughout the show but it's i think that's definitely where it's at right now especially with ammo costs and <laughs> it's just nice and oh for sure uh, convenient yeah so you shot a match this weekend yeah. You were at the NRL 22 championship. So looks like you finished pretty, pretty high up, pretty good. So how did it go for you? Uh, man, it was a you know, fantastic weekend. Ended up winning it, uh, winning the championship, winning the match. Uh, and it's back to back championships. I won it last year as well. Um, so I had a, you know, a great weekend not too shabby no no pretty good weekend uh definitely uh a little nerve-wracking going in trying to win it back to back uh, but yeah i got it done and here we are is there more pressure going in having one before and thinking you have to prove something or is there more pressure not having ever won one and trying to win your first? Uh, I think definitely more pressure trying to win it the second time. Um, especially, uh, you know, I, I'm not one to look at results on two day matches typically. And then, uh, you know, you always, I always end up hearing roundabout, you know, how I'm doing, you know, by other shooters and Saturday night, uh, some of the guys, they sent the results out. Some of the guys was talking and they didn't tell me exactly where I was, but, uh, I knew I was down and I ended up knowing Sunday morning I was down pretty bad. Uh, so that, 
I struggled with that mentally uh, a little bit Sunday, but. Uh, Apparently it worked though. Yeah, yeah, I'm usually one to get motivated. Uh, typically, you know, if I can't do something or, uh, you know, I'm struggling, you know, just brings out the drive and motivates you to try a little harder. So I definitely shot better Sunday than I did Saturday. So every two day match, you just need someone to tell you on Saturday night that you're way behind. <laughs> Even if you're not, <laughs> I'll just tell you you're way behind. Yeah. Be like, man, <laughs> so-and-so has like got a huge lead on you and you'll be like, oh no. Keep that <laughs> thing on up. <laughs> what were your favorite stages? Did you have favorite stages that weekend? Uh, overall, it was a great match. Um, it was more of a positional match. Uh, I think it was probably 18 stages of positional shooting, uh, and probably 20 shots prone total for the weekend. So that was pretty awesome. Um, one stage in particular that had a cart, uh, me and Greg was talking about that earlier, set a cart set up on like a, uh, like a train track. You know, they had a winch and pulley system. So it's kind of a reverse mover where you was in the cart shooting uh, and then they had lanes cut through the trees. So you had to time your shots through the trees, uh, you know, and deal with the cart bouncing up and down on the, on the track. So that was probably definitely the funnest stage of the weekend. That's pretty cool. It was awesome. Uh, Never shot anything like that before, so it was just a learning experience and uh, definitely a fun one. So was it like the track is here and there's multiple openings for you to get X amount of targets out here, or was it like the track is here and there's an opening with two targets, and if you don't get them during that opening, when you get to the next opening, you can't see them. So did you lose your opportunity to engage those targets, or were they all visible from every position does that make sense so it was uh is one target static target uh i think it's 79 yards and it was a diamond uh and then they had the uh, the track run you know parallel with it and then uh you know there's multiple trees and then you know a few gaps you could shoot in but you got you got one pass down and then one pass back I think uh, total run was like a minute, 20 seconds, uh, 10 shots. So definitely not a stage you'd want to have a malfunction on. No. So how did you approach this stage? Did you shoot it like a mover where you knew how fast it was going or did you rotate your gun to stay on the target as you were moving? So basically like a, you know, a reverse mover. Um, you know, I would set up in front of the target and, and let the cart bring me to the target versus, you know, the target coming to you. Cool. The, the, was it uh, was it like a known speed for the cart? Like, you know, the cart goes this fast or was it close? To, you know, only 79 yards. Uh, yeah, I think it told us it was one mile an hour. Um is what some of the guys timed it at. Um, you know, typically in rimfire, our, our movers, moving targets one mile an hour. So basically the same hold. Uh, I think it ended up being like, you know, typical mover for rimfire. It's like 1.4 to center. Uh, so I just, uh, I think it was an eight inch, eight inch diamond, I believe. So as soon as you saw the edge of the target, you know, pull the trigger and that was about one mil, 1.2. See, my brain says that you, you wouldn't need a lead because the bullet's leaving while you're on target. And just because you keep moving doesn't mean, but I guess it moves before it gets all the way out the end of the barrel. I don't know. Yeah. That makes my brain hurt. Th this sounds like, uh, write this down someplace. We'll ask Brian Litz next time he's on the show. <laughs> ask, him, ask him to explain the physics behind all of that. Well, I mean, because theoretically, yeah, we, the bullet comes out 
even if you're moving, it comes out, it's not going to move anymore versus when you send one at a mover, the mover is moving. Does that make sense? Yeah, my brain can't wrap Well, I think it's that what it is, is the, so the bullet's going as you move. And so you want to, you know, if your reticle's here, you're going to want to send it here because the bullet's going to kind of curve into it i think i don't know if you're listening to this or watching yeah this, so real facts this is this is learning trying to figure something out here <laughs> so when you're shooting it i'd watch you know you could watch your trace and it would like you're saying you could watch the bullet curve into the target so it's pretty cool it's like some matrix stuff there hmm. what's that movie with angelina jolie where they curve bullets around walls and <laughs> my bullets do that sometimes they curve around the target mm -hmm. i got them special okay. anti-magnetic bullets that you know it'll be going right out a piece of steel and last second it just yeah cur curves right off any other uh super awesome stages out there this weekend Uh, they had a bus stage where they had like true and tar. They had like one inch bars. They had a vertical and a horizontal bar. You had to get into the bus and shoot through the windows. And I think it was five different positions. And then they had a vertical and a horizontal bar, uh, five different yardages. And nobody had cleaned it. And the ROs, when I got up there, he said, uh, they're giving out popsicles. And he said, I'll give you two popsicles if you clean this state. You'll be the first one to clean it. <laughs> and I got up, got up in there and managed to clean it. It was so hot. I was like, man, those popsicles are nice. So <laughs> they got the top ROs for sure. <laughs> I got to eat two popsicles. <laughs> but yeah, it's fun. You know, just little things like that. ROs giving out popsicles. So we, we, we learn more ways to motivate Chris. <laughs> Next time I see you at your match, I'm going to walk up yep. to you. You clean this stage, you get two popsicles. <laughs> That's Absolutely. awesome. Absolutely. So you've <laughs> shot your fair share of rimfire matches. What are some things, either from this match or from other matches, that'll take a match from like a good match to a great match? Um, I have a big pet peeve on, you know, things starting on time uh you know not beating around the bush keeping things rolling you know so we're not there all day just a just a well ran ran match um you know having you know a little you know having plenty of water coolers um you know uh, you know reliable target i know target failures are hard to predict but you know good good reliable targets set up um so you know little things like that really help make a great match um you know in my opinion i think the starting on time is i think we share that pet peeve mm -hmm. because if you tell us all to be there at 7 30 um and first shots at eight i'm totally cool with that I mean, if you say be there at 6.30 and first shots are at 7, I'm totally cool with that. However, if you tell me be there at 6.30 and first shots are at 7 and at 9 o'clock, we are still wandering around kicking dirt. Mm. Ooh, you're going to have an angry Jennifer. Exactly. Well, I like to sleep and I'm like, I could have slept another hour and a half for the love. Like, I like my sleep. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, and it, it's amazing the, the, the little things like, you know, not a range day at SHOT Show when they just straight up ran out of water. That was like, okay, this event is trash. It's scorching hot. We're in the desert and you have no water for me. You're being a little dramatic. They had no water for like five minutes and then more came up. But I I was really thirsty for those five minutes. And it was longer than that because that was my third attempt to find water. It was about an hour, hour and a half there that I just couldn't find water anywhere. But I'm not saying that it, but <laughs> yeah. 
little, little things like that go a long way. Like you should be able to keep everybody hydrated. Yeah. People should have means to relieve themselves and yes, please have enough porta johns and toilet paper. Yes, toilet paper. Oh my gosh, where were we that I ran out of toilet paper? Oh yeah, I remember. I won't say. But I was like in the porta john yelling, <coughs> "There's no toilet paper!" And somebody had some in their truck and went and got me toilet paper. I was not happy. Yeah, I don't mind using a porta john, but I do want to have toilet paper. I don't think that's unreasonable. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the best Rimfire matches that you've ever shot and what made them like make their way to that list? Uh, you know, this year's finale was great. Um, uh, Jason McBride, Doug Bowes and those guys, uh, they had water on every stage. They had trash cans on every stage. Um, you know, they kept the water coolers full. For those that don't know, where was it? Uh, started on time. That was in uh, Liberia, Missouri, um, about two hours west of St. Louis at the Gadsden Shooting Center. Liberia. Yeah, that's kind of what I think about Missouri. I don't like their weather. It's too cold. But I bet it was beautiful right now. Yeah, I, well, I imagined it being, uh, you know, crops, you know, flat fields, but it was totally opposite of that. It was in the mountains in the Ozarks, oh. and uh, we shot in the woods. Uh, so it wasn't what I was expecting, for sure. We were out there a month ago? Two months ago? How long ago was it? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know. A month or two ago and we were in the the crappie part um actually on on isaiah yeah. curtis's farm and it was that it was rolling hills it was crops it was snowing it was raining it was it was gorgeous except listen, it was like being in a freezer which, it was beautiful from the car with the heat on i don't know why anybody wants to live there <laughs> love you mean it isaiah but i don't know i'm a southern girl <laughs> yeah it, it was absolutely beautiful but that is the first time at a match i have had to go and find a farm and feed store to go and buy warmer boots <laughs> that was funny the best part is I, I walked in in my soaking shoes and there was a couple of shooters standing at the checkout line holding their boxes of boots they're like down that way make a left third aisle on your right like thanks, buds. You know exactly what I needed. Yeah. So, in addition to shooting all of these matches, you also host host matches, right? Yeah. So I run uh, VOD Tactical Rimfire here in Western North Carolina in Old Fort. Uh, I've been doing that probably. I think it's the second year I've done that. Uh, it's been great. Uh, really getting to enjoy that better than shooting. Uh, matches have been growing, sold out the past one or two, so it's been great. That is awesome. Um, so what series are your matches associated with? So I run uh, a little, little bit of everything. I run PRS-22. I run the uh, Mars series and I run NRL 22X matches. And then I have my own little four match series for our club. Uh, so we do four matches plus a finale. And so you're, you're doing uh, a, a, something a little bit bigger this upcoming year also, right? So, yeah, for 20, 2022, uh, NRL season runs a little odd, kind of mid-year to mid-year. So the 2022 National Championship I'll be hosting um, in Maxton, North Carolina. Very cool. North Carolina has great weather, I think, for matches. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't every – I know I've been in North Carolina and had matches that it snowed and I did a snow angel, but <laughs> frontline defense. 
for the most part, the weather is really nice up there, I feel like. It's yeah. Pretty mild. Yeah. Other than, you know, some evening thunderstorms through the summer, it's pretty nice for matches. Yeah, that's just the south. Summer. Summer storms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love it. I, yeah. I was there for the first 26 years of my life. <clears throat> I think some of my favorite matches are uh, weather-wise are North Carolina and Virginia. Like Pig River, I think has a great, it's really nice up there when you go. It's not super, super hot. Yeah, it rarely gets that, uh, that like Georgia steam room heat that we get down here sometimes. You know, you'll have hot sunny, sunny days, but it's still, it's always a little bit cooler there, just enough to keep it a little bit more bearable than what we deal with down here like they have a little wind so we have a live question from alan jaworski um he he's shot i saw he shot a prs match this weekend and he's shot all the um the vortex matches and mammoth and all that so but he wants to know what is the best pick for a voodoo action a two or three lug and what barrel length he said i assume contour is a personal preference but is barrel length more about balance than velocity or harmonics with 22s? Um, so the two lug versus three lug, you know, they have the, the Gen 2, which is 90 degree, and then they have the 360, which is 60 degree. So I personally like the 90 degree. That's what I'm used to. So I've always shot. Um, so really, whichever degree throw you want, you know, get that action. As far as barrel wise, uh, I run a 16 twist, uh, 20 inch straight contour. Um, and that's for harmonics and balance. Um, usually around that 20, 20 inch range for rim fires where you want to be. Uh, some guys run 22, some guys run 18, but you know, typically that's the most accurate rim fires are right around that range. I don't even know what your rim fire is because that's what I usually shoot. Greg, what is your rim fire? Um, you know, that one's a six, 16 point one. The one that you shoot, I <clears throat> I should know this. I think it's, <laughs> it's your gun, dude. <laughs> I, I put it together. I put together this nice fancy gun and hand it to hand it to everyone. Hold on. Hand it to whoever. He yeah. has a loaner. I don't have a 22 because I'm broke and I don't have 22. But um, he has a loaner. And so when we go to matches, if I'm there, I'll use that. Really, actually, what he does. 18? 18? I think so. He usually has two stages and he'll put squads. one gun, I mean, two squads. He'll have one gun on one squad and one on the other and then whoever wants to shoot it can shoot it which i think uh, that's it's like, it's like 16 and a half i think that's part of the beauty of um 22 is like everybody can shoot it it's not like center yeah. fire we're like i mean i like everybody but i don't want to shoot a match where me and you are both shooting my gun because it's never going to cool down yeah i've yeah. done it a uh, half of one match and Shout out to Magneto Speed for that awesome fan that just blows air and blows air. I think everybody at the match hated me, but that thing ran nonstop the entire match or the entire second half of the match to keep that cool. You see all the cool things I've done to this recently, Jen? Got that Area 419 rail down on the bottom. Cool. Not all sorts. I think I've shot this gun once, but it's real cool. <laughs> so... Next year, are you hosting a big match? Yeah. Uh, so I'm running the NRL 22X National Championship. Uh, be July 2023 in uh, Maxton, North Carolina. Uh, me and my buddy John is going to be hosting it. Uh, we're going to try to top this year's. It'd be tough. It's a great match, so we'll see. That'll be fun. That's a lot of a pressure. Lot of, a lot of stress. I don't know what will be worse, mass directing or shooting it. That's what I was about to say. That's a lot of pressure. Lot you better make sure you have water. 
Yeah, definitely <laughs> have water. Eastern North Carolina in July will definitely have to have water. Yeah. You're yeah. going to have a, a, a roller coaster to shoot off of also? We're talking about it. We're trying to figure out how we can build that thing. <laughs> <laughs> something like it. That's funny. Definitely cool. Do you feel like for the finale, you need to try to um, try to throw new things at the shooters, like new props or new, you know, things that maybe are more difficult that they haven't seen. Like I know a lot of the NRL matches, you have the stages ahead of time people can practice, you know. So right. do you feel it's important to like kind of throw something new at them that they maybe haven't practiced or haven't done just to kind of challenge them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the national championship. So, you know, the best of the best is there. Uh, so it should be a challenge. And uh, I'll let them battle it out and see who the best is. So. Tyler says he's hoping for all positional championships. I can't tell you about all, but mine will definitely be positional. <laughs> One rule of the match, belly cannot touch ground all all weekend. You got to get off your belly. Yep. So Alan had a follow-up question to his question about the barrel length. He said 20 inch for uh, 22 ELR also. And do you always run subs no matter what? Yeah. Always run subsonic ammo, you know, just because you don't want to have to deal with that transonic. Uh, the transition there, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of match grade uh, supersonic rimfire ammunition anyway. So uh, as far as ELR, I shoot to, you know, four or 500 yards. That's about as far as I go. Uh, I know there's a lot of new fast twist barrels coming out. Uh, you know, cutting edges got their, their book the CNC turn bullets, uh, the copper solids. I haven't really messed with that because I hate reloading. And that's one reason I shoot rimfire. So, mm. but yeah, I mean, you know, the 16 twist 20 inch, I shoot to 500, you know, and it's pretty consistent. So. He's also asking about optics and parallax adjustment being you know, probably being able to go down to 25 yards. Is there a particular optic that you think is superior for 22 particularly? Uh, I'm out on a tangent theta and I think they say the parallax is 50, 50 yards on it. Um, and it's probably lower than that. The thing about rimfire, you know, they say 25 yards on rimfire, but, you know, you may shoot two shots at 25 yards. Um, so really, I wouldn't focus on buying a scope just for that, you know, those couple of shots that you may take. Um, and, it, you know, even if it will only parallax 50 yards, you can always back the power down, you know, and still have good enough sight picture to shoot. That's true. And then Garrett wants to know, what was your biggest challenge that you faced at nationals? Uh, probably like we talked about earlier, you know, Saturday night, knowing that I thought I was down pretty bad uh, and overcoming that and, you know, sh shooting well Sunday uh, enough to come back and try to win it. Um, I'm typically not one to get, you know, nervous for matches. I mean, I've shot for 18 years, shot a, a lot of big championship matches. So uh, definitely this year trying to win it back to back and hearing Saturday night that I might be down, you know, <laughs> kind of got down and out, but. So the mental challenge. <laughs> definitely the mental challenge, yeah. Alan, I see where you say you've camped in the teens in North Carolina several times every February. That does not mean it's smart. <laughs> <laughs> that does not mean that I want to do that. 
crazy. Yeah, I've done that. You wake up in the morning and go to roll your tent up and it like crackles as you're rolling because all the condensation from your breathing overnight formed a layer of ice on the on the tent. <laughs> it's super fun. I miss my younger years. I did all sorts of dumb stuff. <laughs> So uh, wind's quite a bit more challenging with like a 40 grain projectile flying at a thousand feet per second versus, you know, like a 105 flying at 30, 50 or something. And I know you've said you're horrible at reading wind, but your finish this weekend kind of shows otherwise. How do you manage wind with a rimfire and especially like with a rimfire versus what you do with a centerfire? Yeah. Uh. That was one thing about this weekend. Sunday was windier than Saturday. Um, you know, the PRS-22 finale in Texas was super windy. Um, that's really where I, you know, excel in rim fires, the reading wind, uh, and learn how to manage it. Um, but you got to take one shot at a time, uh, do, do a good pre-stage, you, you know, your own glass before you get up there to shoot, uh, make a good initial wind call, you know, plug it in my Kestrel, see what the Kestrel gives me. And, you know, it's real important to watch that first shot. You know, first shot of the stage, most important part of the stage, really. Because uh, that's going to dictate the rest of the stage and, you know, your wind calls. If I could do that every time, I'd be a really good shooter. Same here. As long as I remember to put all the bullets in my magazine and remember where the <laughs> targets were. And no, what's even worse is when I see where it went, and then I just don't believe that that's really what happened. I'm like, no, nah, I don't think that's what that wind is doing. I mean, that bullet just totally reacted to it. But I am smarter than the wind. I'm gonna just do the same thing again and just see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> See, th th this year I actually I had my first match that like at the end of the day I patted myself on the back and I was like you you were pretty good with the wind um you were at Cool Acres right Chris yeah yeah man so I was on the helicopter stage as the wind was increasing and I I'm I'm not like a magic wind whisperer and I shot and my wind call was a little a tiny bit off on my first shot so I adjusted and I got like my next three and I felt the wind get a little bit more harder and notice stuff leaning a little bit more so I adjusted my call was right I hit the next three and then I felt it pick up again and I was like Phew. just like take took a second to breathe I look back and I see my reticle doing this and I'm like what in the world is going on the whole friggin helicopter was shaking I was like I don't even know how to hold for this <laughs> I, I missed the next the next couple after that <laughs> So uh, Joe Salvador wants to know what the what is the preferred match to attend for a honeymoon? Asking for a friend. Preferred match for a honeymoon? Yeah. <laughs> mm, he's trying to get in the doghouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can yeah that's a good point. Like not shooting a match on the honeymoon is probably yeah. the best. I was about to say, you, you had the perfect opportunity to do that, Jen. You were still in town the day after you got married. There was a great NRL 22 going on and you chose to live a life of luxury and relax with your new husband versus coming and shooting a local 22 match. Yeah, I did. Yep. I was a bum. I can't remember what we did. Oh, yeah. Actually, that day we had to come to the house and look for a birth certificate for a child that was getting a job and had to have it right then. <laughs> That's a whole nother long story. We've had a lot of long stories in the last two weeks, but. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I'm sure it was easy to find a birth certificate like a week after you completely finished moving, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, boxes everywhere and they all got emptied and it was in the last one I looked in. <laughs> well, I would assume you would quit looking for the birth certificate after you found it, so. No, it wasn't that I quit looking. They were all empty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, we're about at the midpoint of the show. Remember, if you're watching us live on Facebook, ask any questions you may have in the comment section of the video. We'll ask them live on air like we've been doing. 
Other ways to catch us, you can always check back to the TSM Facebook page. The videos will stay up there forever. We usually upload all the podcasts. Um, we usually upload to, all, I screw up this line every week. We usually upload to all of the podcast platforms the night after the show. So you can take us on the road with you to work, to listen to us while you're working out, whatever you want. And then finally, everything eventually ends up on the TSM YouTube page. So it's a great place to look for some of our past episodes. There's a reason I make you read that every week. <laughs> I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> and I just mess it up every week, but I just have no shame. So I will continue to blunder or I could just change that sentence because actually I'm the one that typed that out. And I have the scene where I can edit the sentence and make it more of what I'm going to say. That's why I make you say it because you wrote it how you talk. And so you can read it. I, well, you could rewrite it for next week and then you can say it. No, we're good. You sure? <laughs> I'll just laugh at you messing it up every week. It's good. <laughs> That's fine. Everyone knows that you're the one that can talk and I'm the one that can build websites and click buttons and stuff like that. That is not always true as evidenced by a few SHOT Show videos that had to have multiple takes. <laughs> Our, <laughs> I found those videos the other day. That was, that was funny. We had one. I know this is totally off topic, but I could not stop laughing. I got, my giggle box was turned over and I would, I'd start to, like, sometimes I wouldn't even get a word out. They'd be like, okay, and go. And I'd be like, and just die laughing. I don't have any idea why, but I just got a giggle and I could not stop. But Have you heard the, the phrase sleep drunk before? Yeah, I was tired, so maybe. Yeah, we, we were both sleep drunk. We were making a video to post to basically say, hey, y'all, we're going to be posting a bunch of videos here soon. You know, this is a crazy day. It was great. Shop shows a wrap. We're heading home. And it, it was like nine takes. Like one of them was an airplane flew over. One of them was one of the... And you started flew. laughing at that. Airplanes always fly. I laughed so I was like, I look at an airplane. It was hilarious. I don't know why. Then there was the milk crate across the corrugated aluminum bridge. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I don't know. So I, I'm not perfect either, but I'm still going to laugh at you. Anyway, back to Chris, because this is why everyone's on the show not to hear us. Um, so I think it's safe to say that you know a little bit about rimfire shooting. You do very well and have won the championship two years in a row. So if someone wants to learn rimfire and really wants to, you know, step up their competitive game, do you offer classes? Uh, actually, I do. I run uh, rimfire specific classes uh, there at VOD in Old Fort at my local range. Um, try to run, I run six person classes, uh, kind of keeps it small and personalized. A lot of one-on-one -on -one with me, um, and I typically run six to eight a year, um, you know, depending on my schedule because I shoot quite a bit and running matches and classes, so it can get kind of busy. So, so yeah. So, what all do you teach in the classes? Uh, so I teach everything from start to finish uh, from rifle setup, uh, gear selection, um, you know, Kestrel, uh, wind reading, truing dope, gathering dope, uh, positional shooting. Uh, we talk about the mental game. Um, what else? Yeah, really just anything you need to know about coming out and shooting a match, I try to cover it, and it's been really, cover, really successful. You cover how to shoot from a moving train car? No. No, because I, I learned that myself this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you <can add> that. <laughs> yeah. So what I've been is shooting a long time, and I don't know. I learn something every match. So what is the desired or what skill level is this class targeted towards? Is this the, I just was watching YouTube and something came up that said NRL 22 and I want to come and learn how to do it. Or like I 
just started shooting. I've shot like three matches. I suck a lot. I need to learn some more. So the good thing about my class is, you know, it's, it's for everybody. I've had guys that's never shot a match before, just went and bought a gun, uh, didn't even have a Kestrel. You know, they come out with like stray lock, uh, got them squared away. Uh, and then I've had guys that's been shooting a couple of years and, you know, that's, you know, top four or five guys um, coming out. So, uh, it's pretty cool. I think I had, uh, five guys, five or six guys top 20, uh, this year at all taking my class and probably, probably 14 or 15, I think top 50. So that was pretty awesome. That is awesome. <clears throat> what if you haven't even decided what gun you want to buy yet? Is there any opportunity for like a, a loaner or something? Yeah, I have a couple loaner guns. They're Voodoo's, uh, fully built, ready to roll. Uh, I'm jealous. Come out and pull the trigger. I'm jealous. Jen wants to know if she can borrow one of them. Yep. Permanently. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's really cool. So like you know if I didn't you know if i'm sitting here watching youtube tonight and this thing called nrl 22 pops up i'm like oh that sounds cool and i could literally call you up and take one of your classes before i spend a penny to find out what i what i truly want to buy because that's always a, a thing that happens when people get into this uh into the sport you know a good example um jennifer is the one that got me into this we shot three gun in uspsa together and she kind of tricked me into shooting a match and she told me she's like this is the best this is the best bag you will ever use this you, you want this i love it it's perfect and so you know i'm a 6'2 dude that is as flexible as a cinder block and you know i i have i'm trying to be not say i have stupid strength but zero flexibility whereas jennifer is like a former ballerina she's actually a female so her body's built completely and totally different than mine. And so I got the bag that she said, because, you know, she's like really smart. And then I got another bag and I was like, wow, this is a million times better than it. So until you actually touch the stuff and try it out for yourself, there's no real way to know what the, what the best thing for you is with, with some stuff, you know, obviously, you know, a rifle yeah. that shoots good is a rifle that shoots good. A Kestrel is a, is a Kestrel magneto speeds and magneto speed but like you know when it comes to bags stocks chassis stuff like that um it's a good thing to have so mike bell's already asking over here in the comments where's the link to sign up for these classes where do we go to sign up how much do they cost all that good stuff how do we No, get mike we don't want you to come back and beat all of us dude he won my butt last weekend uh, i know he's gonna be winning a all so but say Mike Bell showed up to his first match. He had this reticle, you know, the little X on a gun. That, <laughs> it, the, the gun was like older than Jennifer. And he's just been getting better and better and better at every match. And he whooped my butt last weekend. So, yeah, let's get him in that class, see if he can whoop up on, on our boy Scott, who always wins our matches. So, really, if they do want to come, though, how much is it? Where do they sign up? <laughs> Uh, so it's 300 bucks. Um, I typically feed you lunch. Uh, it's eight hour class. And like I say, it's, I limit them to six, six people. Um, so it's, it's, you know, one-on-one -on -one and it's not a lot of me just standing there talking on a whiteboard, you know, showing you things, you know, we we're at the range. Um, so it's, it's hands-on shooting. Uh, and I break stuff down where it's real simple. I don't overcomplicate things. But, uh, you know, you can find me on uh, Facebook, VOD Tactical Rimfire page, or my personal page, Chris Simmons. Uh, it's typically where I post them. And I do have a waiting list. Uh, I think right now I got 12 or 13 guys waiting. Uh, probably the next class will be in the end of this well, we're not in June yet, but the end of June, I'll have one. It's almost so. June. 
Like three oh, hours. A couple hours. Yeah. Well, I got to change over my calendar over there. So Mark Wright said that he uh, he got to watch Curse from the squad behind him, and it was amazing to watch how smooth his bolt manipulation was. Most of us rack the next round as fast as possible to get the next shot off, but we end up having to reacquire the target and readjust can't. He never moved. Definition of slow is smooth and smooth is fast. What are Chris's thought on this principle? Also, congratulations. <laughs> Mark's a good guy. They, him and his daughter come down and shot my last match. So, so yeah. But yeah, uh, like I said, smooth is fast. Um, you know, speed comes with time. But the whole the whole piece about the smooth bolt manipulation, staying on that helps me stay on target. Uh, saves me time looking for the next target or the follow-up shot. I'm already on it. Uh, and follow through with rimfire, follow through is, you know, everything because uh, you have longer dwell time in the barrel. Um, so I, I come up shooting air rifles. So you learn that shooting air rifles, uh, that follow through and dwell time in the barrels, huge. Uh, you think a thousand, you know, thousand eighty foot a second. No matter how quick you moved, it wouldn't affect it, but it definitely affects it. That is very true with the, you know, the bullet moving a third of the speed of your center fire. It's in that barrel for a lot longer. So you got to right. pay attention to that. Right. So Brad Herman says, we also have the Young Guns champion, Garrett Stevens on the stream. What is your top recommendation for those younger shooters getting into shooting to avoid bad habits that a lot of us shooters have? Uh, biggest thing, you know, like I say, come out, take a class, and you know, not necessarily my class. Uh, there's a lot of classes all over the country, um, and get get started in those good habits early on. Uh, that's one thing I see in my classes is guys that's been shooting a while, it's hard to break those bad habits. Uh, guys really struggle getting past that. Um, Especially guys. That's that's one thing of guys versus gals. If you, definitely. If you tell a female, like, hey, doing this wrong, and if you do it this way, it'll be a lot easier, it's like instant. Uh, one thing I like to do in class is, you know, if I see somebody, they're, they're wanting to be stubborn, I say, okay, you know, I'll set a stage up. I say, do it your way, you know, we'll time it, score it, and then we'll do it my way, time it, score it, and see who does it better. So, typically for me, and that kind of, you know, helps them break those habits. So, John Adams says, congrats, Chris. I was at the match and would like to know how you made consistent hits at over 200 yards and the crazy wins at the event and what barrel and twists did you use? I know we talked a little bit about that already, but um, like everybody wants to know your um, wind whispering skills. <laughs> uh, like I said, that, that goes back to the smooth bolt manipulation and the fall through and getting feedback off your previous shot, you know, I watch plate rock, I watch, you know, smoke off targets. And even if I'm, you know, a tenth or two left or right, you know, I adjust that. Um, you know, reading wind, you know, if I feel a wind change on my face, you know, I'll, I'll change wind on the fly. Um, you know, all that stuff adds up. Um, and it was tough uh, in Missouri because we shot through the woods and there wasn't a whole lot of wind indicators. I mean, you could see the, the leaves moving, but it was hard to get a direction on it. Um, so it was definitely more of a challenge versus like in Texas. Um, you know, out, out in the open, you could see mirage and the grass blowing. So it's definitely a lot tougher. The uh, toughest one for me, it was actually my second Rimfire match ever. It was at uh, GTI in South Carolina, and about half of the stages were out of a 10-story tall tower. 
So you didn't feel any wind. Yeah. That was uh that was a challenge. I was like, oh, I guess it's getting windy out there. And you know, if you're shooting out into a you know, a field of short grass and you don't happen to see a tree or see, you know, some long, long uh weed somewhere or something, it's just like, oh, I guess it's getting windier. I gotta move over a little bit. Yeah. That's like connex boxes, you know, buses, mm -hmm. things like that. It's tougher, you know, tougher stages. Mm-hmm. That is very true. So, so go ahead okay. low development's not really a thing with rim fire like it is with center fire um you know with center fire you know we'll do our powder charges do a do a ladder test on that do a seating depth test and come up with our magic formula but you can't really do that when you're just buying a box of bullets and sticking into your gun how do you tune your rifle to your round or your round to your rifle with your rim fire uh through lot testing um you've got a lot test with rimfire ammo uh whether you send it to you know lapua or ely to to one of their test tunnels or you know there's several places you can pick five or six different lots of the same ammo you know get it to the house and test each lot and then order as much as you can of it um but, you know in my opinion it's a must you know, with rimfire, because um, really in rimfire, the ammo is the deciding factor, and you know, it's not like center fire where we can load what we want or need. So we're kind of at the mercy of the ammo. Yeah, I agree with that. I uh, made a trip up to the Ohio test facility, um, and we shot 16 different batches of uh, Lapua Center X through my rifle, and found one that was just I mean it was a hole puncher at 100 meters so we got a case of that sitting here and that's been that it's honestly it's it sounds like a lot of work um, but it's like one of the easiest things in the world it's like oh here is 5,000 rounds of the ammo that shoots best out of your rifle hand us some money and or you know they ship it to you but you know here, here's your invoice pay this it shows up at the door and you're done ammo shopping for a while instead of this, oh, who has it in stock? Who has it in stock? You know, they, they handle that part too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you go out, you true your dope, uh, and you go shoot the year. Uh, yep. Have you ever messed with the uh, barrel tuners at all? So, <laughs> I'm not one for change, but uh, probably a month or so ago, I decided to try out the EC tuner. Uh, I wanted, I thought I needed that little bit of extra, the edge, you know, for this year. And I, I was a little nervous about it and I tested it. I mean, I shot probably 2000 rounds, just different days, you know, different conditions, taking on and off, clean it. Uh, and just want to see how repeatable it was. Um, you know, it turned out to be pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, this year I shot the EC tuner at nationals. Uh, you know, in the couple of weeks before nationals, I shot some amazing groups, especially at distance, um, with it on, and I've been pretty pleased. Obviously, it, it worked out for me this year. I say so. <laughs> the thing about the tuner is. You know, you need a lot test first. Uh, the tuner's not a miracle. So, you know, lot test first, get a good lot of ammo, low SDs and ESs, and then tune that lot even better. It's a lot of work to find the exact combination that works, but if you find it, I think it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, like you said earlier, you know, you, you buy a case of 5,000 rounds and, you know, for most people, that'll last a full year or more and you're done. So Mark says he's having trouble seeing trace and impacts and he blames it on his vision. Me too, Mark. The older I get, it is getting worse. It's getting harder. <laughs> um, 
but he's going to work on his follow through. Do you have a recommended power to run the scope on for seeing trace mirage and impacts? Uh, so everybody asks me what power I run and I typically run 22 to 25 and people look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wouldn't have I thought it's... that. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, typically your NRL PRS shooters uh, are around 12 power, uh, 12, 15. Mm -hmm. uh, I shot silhouette for years and we shot straight. I shot a straight 36 and a straight 24. So the high power doesn't bother me. Uh, you know, I've just got used to it. Um, it's like you're saying, the follow through. Uh, you know, and having a, you know, my rifle weighs 25 pounds. Uh, when you set that thing on a barricade, it doesn't move. I was about to say, I bet that thing does not move. No. Uh, you know, that helps with follow through and being steady to see trace. Um, and breaking that bad habit of, you know, coming up off the gun, staying on the gun a little longer and, and focus on watching the bullet um, and obviously having good quality glass helps too. So Chad Heckler says that he also runs 20X running that higher magnification. Well, apparently yeah. it works, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, over the, over the course of the last year, I've started gradually increasing and increasing because I was a 12 to 15 and 12 to 15 besides four, you know, on a long range stage where I'm sitting there shooting prone and I know I'm not going to lose the target. And I've, you know, my favorite thing is, you know, as far as memorization is when you have one of those stages where you line up 20 people and it's all right, you go. And when they shoot, I sit there and I go target to target. And, you know, I've gone target to target 20 times by the time I shoot. So I can move from target to target with my eyes closed and I'd run a higher power then, but I've started cranking them a little bit more this last season. Um, I thought that the weird thing is I thought that my, that I was losing vision and I was going to need a new set of glasses and something. And I went last week to the, uh, to the eye doctor and I have exactly the same vision. So maybe my processing power is diminishing or something. I'm not really sure. Um, Mike sure. Bell asked, do you tune for a certain distance or did the ammo and tune shoot good at all distances? Um, he has an EC tuner and he hasn't shot past 100 yet. Uh, so I started at 50 and uh, I couldn't distinguish. Uh, so I kind of ladder test like you would in center fire. Um, so basically started at zero, went out every three turns uh, until I could see a node. But I tried it at 50 and I just couldn't distinguish the nose. The groups was too good. So I went to 100. And then you could really start telling, you know, tell the tape would come out and you could start seeing the nodes. So I tuned it at 100. Um, you know, found the node. Uh, I think my number was like 22. Um, you know, took it on and off. And I even swapped different lots of ammo, different brands of ammo. And once I was in the node, you know, that was, that was my number for every ammo. Um, and then I went and shot it out the distance, shot some groups. Um, so that was my process. And, you know, I've heard before that you can only tune to one distance, but, you know, I found that not to be true. You know, it held, it held true all the way out. That's good. And that, that would make sense that if it's shooting tighter at 50, it's going to continue to be tighter. It might not be as tight, but it's, you know, not yeah. be like inversely related or something. Yeah. And I run, you know, I run a chronograph, you know, the whole time, you know, if I, if one flew out, I could look at the chronograph and be like, okay, you know, that's a high shot or a low shot uh, just to eliminate that variable. So. Makes sense. Um, John Adam asked, how important is the balance point of your rifle and where does yours balance? Uh, 
so my bounce is right basically right on the front action screw just just in front of the mag wheel um uh, just because typically when you set the rifle down on a barricade that's where it's sitting uh, and i'm not fighting the rifle on my shoulder when i set it down it's there i fall in behind it um uh, and i'm not having to fight it so you know in my opinion balance is is everything uh, the less you're fighting the rifle the more steady you're gonna be i agree with that mm -hmm. i also agree with what Mark Wright just commented, he said that you have to have great natural point of aim to run such high power. And the more you improve your point of aim coming into the scope, the more power you can run. I agree with you, Mark, on that, because if you don't have good natural point of aim, you're not going to fall in and find the target. You're going to be searching, which then is going to further mess up your natural point of aim because you're not going to be behind that rifle. So I think that what you said just hit the nail on the head personally i don't know what chris thinks um but i think that if, if you have a good natural point of aim and you found it you're going to come down and just fall into it so what do you think chris absolutely uh you know that goes back to balance and fighting the rifle you know if your natural point of aim is not on you know you're putting inadvertent pressures on the rifle and you know you're going to push shots left and right um and that comes with, you know, I find target identi identifiers, you know, whether it be a tree or a rock or something. Set the rifle down and get in the general direction of the target, uh, you know, and square up behind the rifle. Uh, running such high power, you got to do little things like that. <laughs> That's the next national champion, huh? We hope so. We hope so. Greg, what you got? Um, so you not only shoot rimfire. Um, I know I saw you out at the uh, MPA PRS match at Cool Acres. Which one is your favorite, and how do you compare it to a rimfire versus centerfire? Uh, rimfire is definitely my favorite. Um. Just because I don't have to wear earplugs and you can have a normal conversation with people. <laughs> um, seems to be more laid back. Uh, and the guys that shoot rim fires, just a great group of guys. And the guys that shoot center fires, a great group of guys too. But it just seems like the rim fire community is just, just awesome. You know, we're just out there having fun. Uh, it's just laid back. Um, so definitely rim fire, um, just because I hate wearing earplugs, especially when it's 90 degrees. Uh-huh, I got to wear them at work, and it's just, it, it's so great. And, you know, you're ro and it's just like impact, impact, and, and, and that's all you got to do. I, uh, one time I was ro in a rimfire match and i forgot that i was at a rimfire match so i did my normal impact call and like the entire match was just like sorry sorry you guys are quiet i'll i'll talk more quietly now <laughs> and, and especially with with super cool things like this my, my teeny little can on the end of my gun that gun is friggin silent i love it it's nice very very quiet so what goals do you have, Chris, for, I mean, you've won the national championship. So it's like, well, now what do you do? Where do you go from there? So what goals do you have for yourself, not only as a shooter, but a match director and an instructor? Uh, so really, um, I have a baby due in the end of October. I'd like to go to uh, Texas and defend the PRS 22 finale. <laughs> Uh, so that's that's a little bit up in the air right now, um, but the big goal is centerfire. Um, I've only been shooting centerfire on and off for two years now, um, so I want to get pretty heavy in centerfire now. That I've got some really good sponsors behind me. Um, eventually, AG Cup, um, and then as far as a match director. You know, like I said, I'm running the national championship next year. So I'll be focused on that and uh, try to run the best national so far. 
and then as a class, you know, running classes, um, I'm working into an advanced class. So try to do a basic class and advanced class and try to run some more of those. Very good. Everybody wants to do AG Cup. <laughs> AG Cup is awesome. Didn't we talk to somebody that wanted to do an AG Cup type of 22? This year I've been so distracted with life that I can't remember. Who was it that we were talking to that was going to do a rim fire? Chris, you're not on your head. Who was it? Jason Nedved. Yes, it was Nedved. How did I forget that? But see, they had that big, big cash match, big money match out there. Was it, was it him or was it Jim that ran that? I don't know. Someone Jim. with big money. Nedved is talking about doing one that. Yeah, Jim C's doing uh, like a big cash match. Uh, I think he said like a thousand bucks to win. But I think uh, Nedved's doing like a AG Cup where it pays every stage to win plus a big payout in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And that's the first year for that, I think. So. Yeah, that that would be cool. I also heard rumblings um, here locally of a. Uh, sniper match style 22 match that i'm kind of excited about something, something a little, yeah something a little bit different mix mix some mammoth up with some <coughs> 22 good i'll do some mammoth with a five pound rifle <laughs> you like that carbon fiber <laughs> you, get you, want, you want to borrow it you could literally just it weighs nothing you think barrel. it weighs nothing until you add all the ounces and everything adds up to a lot more than you think it is. Well, no, see, I, I put this in my truck and drive it to where I'm shooting. I don't carry it. It goes in the back of the truck. And then actually from there, I unload it from the truck and put it in the golf cart, and the golf cart brings it to the stage. L-A-D-Y. So uh, John made a comment that uh, – um is kind of i i guess it goes both ways um or wait was it where'd it go about faster twist yep so there's that one. Oh, uh dick made it he said he heard that rim fire doesn't translate to center fire the i guess the skills and everything that you pick up from one doesn't fully transfer over what are your thoughts on that uh, well, I think that's not true at all. I mean, you know, rimfire is a great training tool for center fire, I believe. Uh, you know, your fall through is a lot more important just because the dwell time is a lot more. Uh, the wind reading aspect is probably twice as hard. Um, you know, we don't have load development so we're fighting ammo so we're testing ammo uh, you, know, you just got that the speed of center fire you know it seems like you have more forgiveness you know in targets than you would in rim fire yeah, and the the one thing that i would agree that doesn't translate over um i accidentally went 11 months without shooting a center fire match i'm not quite sure how and so cool acres was my rude awakening to that long period of shooting nothing but rim fire i have a tendency of being shooting a rim fire match and be like this is a really awkward position but i could just kind of hold the gun over here and look through and i could see perfectly and you know the gun's not really touching me but i could see fine and that does not work with center fire so i ended up doing a lot more um quote unquote free recoiling and awkward positions that i got really used to shooting so much rim fire that it kind of um kind of bit me when i got back to shooting both but yeah. a lot of the other stuff does translate over very well yeah well, i'll say if anybody wants to ask or question that to look at allison zane because she started in 22 and built all of her fundamentals in 22 and then crossed over to center fire. And it was not very long before she was whipping everybody's tail. Just saying. 
Yeah, that was like immediate domination. Yeah. Yeah. They're like 99% yeah. of the stuff translates over. It's just like the, you know, I, I did pick up a couple of bad habits from it, but, you know, building the positions, the basic fundamentals, you know, you're not, obviously the wind calls aren't the same, but you got to pay a lot more attention to the wind out there because it blows that teeny little slow bullet around a whole lot more. Um, there's a uh, there's a lot of chatter over in the comments about a cool match that we got coming up. Um, it's literally a combination of everything out there. There's NRL 22X Hunter style match going on in the arena training facility down here in Georgia. Have you seen that match at all? I have, yeah. Uh, kind of bummed out because it's the same weekend as one of my matches. So I'm not going to get to shoot it. Yep, and it's the uh, the same weekend that I'm Colorado. One of the vortex matches going on that weekend, yeah. so uh, it should be it should be fun. I I definitely want to shoot that, and if it happens again, and I'm in town that weekend, I will 100% be there because that just sounds like a super cool combination. Yeah, arena is a huge place and. They could have a really awesome rimfire event there, I believe. Indeed. Very cool. Are there any more lives, Greg? I think we're good on lives. All right. I think we can just about wrap this down to shout outs. We usually let you start, Greg. All right. Um, so to start off, I was uh, talking about it earlier. GSL suppressors, these super awesome things over here that keep my 22 like whisper silent. Shooters and sharpshooters of Augusta, our local indoor and outdoor ranges. PDC Custom, most beautiful rifle chassis known to man, available on lime green and normal human colors. Shooters World Powder, um, I've still not ran out through this whole pandemic, global supply chain shortages, et cetera, et cetera. They managed to keep their stuff on the shelves. Obviously, there's still a short supply, but I've been managed to find enough actually here at Shooters of Augusta. Um, Hunter's HD Gold, as we were just discussing before, I'm super blind. They help out a whole lot. Fix it six, because I like taking things apart. Um, and Vortec um, to keep your rifle clean, which I have not done a very good job at doing recently. I got all the fancy tools. I just neglect to use them. All right, Chris, how about you? Shout outs. Yeah, shout out to uh, Voodoo Gunworks, uh, running their Gen 1 action, uh, Motocam Custom Rifles, my local gunsmith here, uh, Krieger Barrels, uh, both rimfire and center fire, they make amazing barrels. Um, the pool ammunition, I uh, picked them up this year. Uh, center fire and rimfire, you know, make some of the best components. Uh, Kafaro International, um, Walsh Custom Defense, Atlas Bipods, um, and Bison Tactical. <laughs> Lots of hang on. Sorry, got a kid coming in. <laughs> <laughs> he finally got in the door and went. <laughs> yeah, I got a two year old running around somewhere. Oh, well, no, that's like a 19 year old. Wait a little while. Oh. <laughs> He just got home from work and he came in the door and was like, ah. <laughs> he was on the phone. But anyway, it happens. Oh, yeah. Well, I just want to shout out uh, to you, Chris, for spending, what, two hours of your Tuesday night with us. I know you got little ones and a family that you want to spend time with. So shout out for coming on and talking about Rimfire and um, also a shout out just for all that you do for the sport by running matches and you know, teaching, kind of passing it on. So I uh, want to tell you, thanks for all of that stuff and congratulations on a, on a win this past weekend. And, and then I'll just have to do a shout out to my new husband for letting me do all this and, and letting me have the time away because I know uh, doing the show actually
actually does take a good bit of time between, you know, Tuesday nights and then when we travel and cover matches and all that. So shout out to him for putting up with it and for some reason still wanting to get married. So <laughs> shout out to him for that. Yeah. And with that, it'll be a wrap for episode 377 and we will see everybody next week. Yeah. Thank you guys.